as we cut the ribbon, we are opening the doors of this house for the presence of God. This will be a habitation, a dwelling place of God, that people that are broken, that are lost, will come to this place to encounter the love, the grace, and the mercy of God. This building is not going to go to heaven, but this building will be a vehicle and a vessel that we can use to plunder hell and populate heaven. But it's going to happen as we ourselves firstly get committed to our assignment. And what that is to be followers of Christ, to be full on for Jesus. Unlock the melody within your unused instruments. Donate today and empower aspiring musicians. Your generosity resonates with the harmony of opportunity. Make a difference by donating your musical instrument. For more information on how you can donate, contact your zone pastor or visit your nearest information desk.
Separate us from your love Never fading, you won't give up You won't give up on us
what Moses cried out for. cried out to God and he said show me your glory God's immediate reply was I will make all my goodness pass before you I want you to know tonight that God is good and God's intention toward you is good it says I know the thoughts I think toward you thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope so tonight as we cry out for God's glory we know that God hears us we know that God sent His Son to prepare a way for you and me so that we can access the very glory of God. That is the goodness of God. So Father, we come tonight and we lift hands to You. And as Moses prayed under the old covenant, so we pray tonight and we say, show us, show me Your glory, Father. And I thank You that You are the same yesterday, today and forever. That Father, as you said to Moses, you say to us tonight, I will make all my goodness pass before you. As you said to David, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. So Father, we find our rest in you tonight. Our safe place is in you tonight. We thank you that these are the days that we will experience your very glory in Jesus' name. If you believe it and receive it, give the Lord a praise tonight. Come on. All over South Africa, give the Lord a praise tonight. Come on. Everybody on Faith TV, give the Lord a praise on Praise TV. Facebook Live, YouTube Live, CRC Online, radio stations, people all over the world with us tonight. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands, actually millions of people this program goes out to. And we pray that when you watch this, the very glory and the presence of God will visit your house and will touch you and your family and your life will not and cannot be the same in the name of Jesus. Welcome to all our CRC churches. Great to have you with us. Tens of thousands gathering in buildings all over South Africa, Namibia and Botswana. We welcome you from the capital of South Africa. The Wolfstadt van South Africa, Pretoria. Kom jylle Pretorianers, loof hier met blije gaan en verwelkom jy aan die mense samen ons vanavond. 
and Jesus' name, we welcome you. And we pray that what we experience in this place, you will experience as well. There are more people, as a matter of fact, in the church in Bloemendijk than yeah, the thousands gathered here. Yeah, there are many, many more thousands gathered in Bloemendijk. So we welcome Bloemendijk, especially Johannesburg, Cape Town in the new building. Hey, Kimberley moved into their 3,000 seater building. Oh, that is amazing. And it's for the glory of God. And we thank God that we are taking territory for God. Amen. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I said it, and there were many political leaders there. And I said, while things are broken in this country, we are doing what God told us to do. We are building. Amen. We are builders. We are not breakers. And Jesus said, I will build my church. And yes, the building is not the church. Like a hospital is not the hospital. The building is not the hospital. It is the theater. It is the doctors. It's what's happening in the building that makes it a hospital. So please get a life when it comes to the church of Jesus. The building is not the church, but the building houses the church. And we thank God for facilities that we can operate from. Come on, say amen if you love the church right I mean the university building is not the university if there was no lecturer no professor there would be no university so let's why do we always have to try and break the kingdom of God down uh, and reduce it to something that is nothing while it is actually the most important thing in society it is what God is building it is what God is reigning from and we should love the church and stand for the church and fight for this holy ground say amen tonight in Jesus name come on if you love the church if you love the church give the Lord Jesus a praise hallelujah I mean, if this building wasn't here, you wouldn't be here. And uh, it's like saying we don't need hospitals, we don't need uh, universities, we don't need schools. What a, what a backward way of thinking. That everybody needs a facility except the Christians. The Muslims don't mind. They built a 1.3 billion mosque in Midrand and nobody says anything about that. Cash. But let the Christians do something for the glory of God. Then suddenly they hate to shout and they hate what God's doing. I'll tell you why. Because what we're doing is real and it's not going to be so. Oh, come on, give the Lord a praise. Come on. Yeah, you can give God a bigger praise than that. Okay, we're not going to get silent. Amen. Amen. Are you happy? And if you weren't happy, that's, that's not my challenge, right? And if you came out here to spy out the liberty we have, then God bless you. I pray that God touches you and that God changes you. All right, we're not going to apologize for preaching the Word of God and getting people saved and uh, getting people closer to God. You may take your seats in heavenly places. Let's continue to talk on In Pursuit of God. And next week, if you know anybody in Geor, George, we are having our first harvest event in the stadium of George. So tell people in George, go to the stadium next Wednesday night, right? And then in Supersport Park, we are having our harvest event, Pretoria, for Pretoria and Johannesburg on the 8th of May, 2025. No, 2024 now. Amen. We're going to get louder. I said we're going to get louder. I said we're going to get louder. Because we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not ashamed. We are not ashamed because our cause is just. So let's talk about, continue tonight to talk about your pursuit of God. James chapter 4 verse 8. The Bible says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Psalm 37, 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. Say it tonight. Say, it is good for me. No, everybody say it. Say, it is good for me to draw near to God. And we're going to talk about how to draw near to God and what happens when you get closer to God because it's the only place where you will change and uh, where your values will change and where your life will change when you get closer to God who created you. Hebrews 10 verse 19, the Bible says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness. Everybody say boldness. In Afrikaans beteken het vrijmoedigheid. I grew up in a home, a real Afrikaner home, where we were taught, 
kinders word gesien en nie gehoor nie. Now maybe you never grew up like that, but I did. I grew up very conservative. Now I'm preaching in English. And uh, my dad was a disciplinarian. And you didn't speak unless spoken to. Now I was his blue-eyed boy, okay? That's a fact. But the most affection he would show is every now and again put his hand on my leg. Or after a rugby game say, that was okay. But we, we never had this relationship in our family, which was very conservative, very proper, very decent, where everything has to be according to the rules. So, I mean, if you have lunch or dinner together, kijk op maat, jy sit doodstil, jy sê nie, jy woord nie. Die pa sê daar so, dan sê die vier kinder, die ma sê daar nie, drie kinder, en die vier, ons was vier kinders, my, my oors was ook soos koenijne gewees. In elk geval, um, so the, the, the four children sit there, and uh, uh, you just do anything that's not, your dad just looks at you, jylle wat bril daar weet wat jylle doen, and he just looks at you over his glasses like this, dan weet jy nou, play still, sê niks. You don't talk unless you are talk, spoken to. Now, I think many people, because they never had a relationship with the earthly father, really need a revelation of how to have a relationship with their heavenly father. Because many of us grew up, some of us grew up not knowing our earthly father. Some of us grew up adopted. Some of us grew up abused by our earthly fathers. Little girl molested. Now you're a woman of 40 years old, 50 years old. I'll never forget this lady that was a pastor's wife for um, 50 something years. They had a great church in Pretoria. When her husband died, she came and spoke to me and she said, I have to tell you something. She was broken and she had the most wonderful husband that you can think about. An amazing man, a man of faith, loved her. And after his death, she came to me and she said, I was never able to give myself to my husband fully. I was molested as a, as, a, as a child. My earthly father molested me and I carried that into my marriage. And now that my husband dies, I feel guilty. I never told my husband. I said, it's okay. He loved you enough. But because of what happened to her past in the natural, it stopped her from having a free relationship with her husband. And for many people, I mean, some of you, um, they were not flying saucers. Yeah, they, in our home, there were some flying saucers, okay? And flying shoes, okay? That was the day parents raised their children in those days. Or you say something too much, you get a backhand at the uh, uh, seat. It's not like, like we grew up on the wrong side of town. That's just the way that parents raised their children in those days. You step out of line, you get smacked. Now, I'm not saying you should get smacked, but I think some people need to get smacked. <clears throat> I'll fake that. Um, I mean, some people were, were beaten by their dads into the ground. People I know personally that are now in the church. Some people saw their mothers beaten by their dads. And now you talk about God, the concept of God as a father. And although we say amen to that, it is a very difficult concept because we always take the natural and then we take it into the spiritual. That's why we need a revelation of who God is. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to teach us God as a father. Not God as a religious stern God out there with a rule book and a big stick to hit you over the head. But He came to reveal that God's plan for man is a relationship. That God wants to walk with you. And we spoke about it last week. That we see from Genesis, it was God's will to walk with man. God walked with Adam in the Garden of Eden. God walked with Enoch. And then one day, God took him to heaven. One of the two witnesses that have to come back one day and have to die. Otherwise, they would be the firstborn of the dead. Right? Elijah and Enoch still has to come back in the tribulation. And they have to come and physically die on this earth. So Enoch was so close to God. One day, he just stepped into the third heaven. And he walked with God. I think they had a conversation and God said, okay, we've gone too far for you to go back to your house. You just come with me. And he walked with God and he's there with God. Listen, think about it. Physically, he's in the presence of God and he never died. He still has to come and die. Elijah went into the heaven physically and he still has to come to this earth and die. The two witnesses. That's Otherwise, they would be the first begotten. They would have overcome death. They cannot. They still have to come. The Bible is clear revelation and the book of Daniel, they have to come. So in the Old Testament, we see God walks with Noah. God always is looking for somebody to walk with. He walks with Job. 
Nowhere is a just man. He's perfect in his generation. God walks with Abram. Abram is called the friend of God. God walks with Moses. And every time Moses, under the law, goes into the temple, the tabernacle, the Bible says the pillar of cloud descended and the people stood at their tent door and they watched God talk with Moses. Not God instructing Moses, but I love that Scripture that says God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. We have to talk about that because that's where we change, right? Couples, intimacy, the longer they are married, the more they begin to look like one another. So there's hope for all the men. And all the men said, Amen, in Jesus' Name, right? You're going to become beautiful as your wife and your children are going to be beautiful like your wife and they might have a little bit of your brains, okay? But intimacy can never be replaced. And our calling was to be intimate with God. So Jesus comes and He reveals God as what? Father. Not as Elohim, Jehovah, Yahweh, which is the Holy God in the, old, in the Bible. He still is that. But He brings a new dispensation, which is Father. A Father that is, that is accessible. I'll say it again. A Father that is accessible. A Father that is accessible. Many of us have fathers that are not accessible. Fathers that are accessed on their terms. My best friend that studied with me at university, when God called me, into the ministry from university. God spoke to him as well. He studied agriculture and his father wrote him out of his will because he decided to answer the call of God. Because back in the day, back in that day, even some fathers ruled from the grave. Now thank God that we are also, we are liberated by the grave. Amen. We are not ruled by the grave. We are liberated through the death and the burial and the rec- Oh, come on, man. And the resurrection of Jesus. And therefore, we now have access to the Father. We can now come and say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We can come as sons and daughters of the living God. Romans chapter 8 says, We have not received a spirit of bondage again to fear because that's what the law produced. The law produced fear. But we've received this spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So the image that we have in the natural very often comes over into our spiritual world and then that becomes a distorted image of God. And uh, many of us grew up on a performance-based love system. I think there are certain things that parents should do. Tell Yanni, mark your bed up in the ochtend. Je is 18 jaar oud. Niemand gaan meer jou bed opmaak nie. Je kan nou maar jou eie bed opmaak en jou eie lakens recht trek. Nee? But a, 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 a lot of the love that we experienced was totally conditional, which was if. If you do this, I will do that. If you get these marks, I will do that. Now God comes and He demonstrates a love that is totally unconditional where there's no love. Where it's a love that is totally one-sided. A love that is unrestricted. A love that is filled with grace and mercy. A love that should give us the boldness. And that's why I am stopping here for a moment. The Bible says we can come boldly. We have unrestricted access by the blood of Jesus Christ, not our works. So having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now family, that is huge. Because under the Old Testament, only the high priest could enter the holiest once a year to make atonement for sin. But now God comes, the writer of Hebrew, who I believe is Paul, but it may be anybody, might be a a lady, I don't know. Um, Okay. And... He, 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 he comes and he, and he teaches people that everybody now has access to God, not just the high priest. Think about the, 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 the challenge the Jews faced with his teaching. They grew up under the law, the law which was our tutor, our keeper, the law that was there to preserve and protect, the law that was there to prepare us for a dispensation called grace that came through Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 says grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the law served a purpose. And the Bible says the law was a tutor and the purpose of the law was to bring us to grace. 
to the person of Jesus Christ. Now he writes and he says, having boldness to enter the holiest. You understand that if the high priest in the Old Testament had any sin in his life and he entered the holiest, he dropped dead. You do get that. You, you get it that if you lived under the old covenant, you would not serve God with the freedom you had today. Because the motivation or the law of the old covenant, the law produced what? The emotion of fear. People were afraid of God. Nobody had boldness and freedom to access God. Even the high priest, he had bells at the bottom of his robe. He had a rope tied around his waist. And he went in there and while they heard the, 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 the bells um, chiming or whatever bells do, uh, ringing, they knew he was alive. But when it was silent for too long, they knew he was dead. And they pulled him out because no one was allowed to go into the holiest. No one was allowed to go into the holiest. I think... I think if we don't understand what Jesus did for us, we become familiar and, and we don't appreciate the sacrifice and we don't appreciate the right and the privilege we have to access this holy place that only the high priest could access. We have to understand this, understand what Jesus did for us, that this is not something we can do by the way. Under the old covenant, people were instructed to perform cleansing rituals and to keep certain laws and to do certain things, to work their way into God's presence. Now God says, you have free access. And He has the sad thing, we have it. We are the only, we're not a religion, but we are the only, uh, what's the right word? Qu religion, quote unquote, not a religion. We understand that there is no work required to be justified. Everybody else is required to work their way into God's presence. Christians are required to do nothing. Give the Lord a praise, come on. That, that, that we can come and because we don't understand the sacrifice Jesus paid and the privilege we have to access the very holiest, I think sometimes we get confused and we treat this privilege with disrespect. It was under the old covenant if God said, you do this, you do that, and you didn't, you died. Now we have so much freedom that our freedom we have often becomes a stumbling block in our respect, our reverence, and in the way that we serve this holy God. Because we are now so focused on self that we don't understand what Jesus actually did for us. He gave us access that Adam had before sin. He gave us access into the very presence of God who is still the same, holy, omnipotent, omnipresent, but now defined by love. God is love, 1 John chapter 4 says. We now have access because of what Jesus did for us, a dispensation of grace that will run out. We, there will be no longer grace left after Jesus came back. So we need to respect this, understand this, embrace this and make our way into the presence of God and come into the presence of God and spend time with this God whose heart yearns to have a relationship with each and every one of us individually. You don't pray to God to, through a Pope. You don't pray, pray to God through a Saint Bernard. You don't pray through God through Mother Mary. She's honored for eternity. But there's no scripture that says pray through Mother Mary. I'm not attacking any church. You don't pray through a forefather. We all have forefathers. We don't pray through them. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, our access to God is one way. I said one way. Everybody say one way. There is one way to the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That doesn't just mean salvation. When you pray to the Father, you pray in the name of Jesus. When you come to God, you come based on the sacrifice Jesus did for you. The Bible says there remains no more sacrifice. There's not a cleansing ritual you can perform during Easter that will get you closer to God. There's not a sacrifice you can make that will get you closer to God. You have access into the presence of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Man, if you believe it, somebody jump to your feet. Give the Lord a praise. It's a good word. Come on.
So he says, let me read it again. Having boldness to enter. Now, you can enter the director's office, but if you don't enter it, you'll never benefit. We have, the, the, we have access. God doesn't want you to know about his, 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 his works. He wants you to know His ways. He wants you to know Him intimately. I haven't even started and you're giving me 10 minutes. Um, he, he wants you to know Him. So a, a, a lot of people out there think they know me. They've never even met me. They know nothing about me, but they have an opinion. They know what? Nothing, nothing, zippo about me. Zippo. They haven't spent a minute with me. Well, I'm not saying I'm God, but if you don't spend time with God, you won't know who God is. Because you're serving God based on your father. You're serving God based on your tradition, on your culture. You serve God based on, you have to know the author. You don't just need to know the biography. You need to know the author. Jesus came to introduce the author. You can have a conversation with the author. The book the author wrote introduces you to the author so that you can have a living relationship with the author who is God as your father and access is by the blood of Jesus Christ. But if you don't spend time with God, you'll never get to know God. It's not rocket science. Teenagers who should not date, um, but who are dating, um, what do we call it? They do what? Group dating. Huh? What's that? The other day you did something like speed dating. And I see some of you met your partner. Okay, whatever. But how do you decide this is the right person to marry? You don't, uh, please don't do this thing. I prayed and the Lord told me. Well, uh, you know, that can be so manipulative to say to a girl, I prayed and the Lord told me you're my wife. <laughs> I mean, actually, you know, when we grew up as young Christians, we were taught um, you put everything on a confession list and then you write your 397 um, requirements that you have for a perfect wife. Anybody ever did a list? Don't put up your hand and reveal yourself here. Yeah? And, and, and you, you, you spiritualize everything and it's like you're going to get to know that girl but from a distance. And I was guilty of that as well. I confess. There was this girl in church. That's before I met Narita. But there was this girl in church and uh, she was a prayer warrior. And I thought, okay, I'm called. I need a prayer warrior. I need an intercessor. Don't say yes now, please. I thought I needed an intercessor. And then I visited her the first time, and uh, there was just nothing. It was like, Hallelujah, Shakaraimando Koburisi, Eakaya Ramasa Talabanda Kaferebesi. And then it's like, Okay, let's talk. Let's talk. Um, what do you like? Um, So what I'm trying to say is through courtship, you court to get to know the person. That's why you delay certain affections and emotions. So if you want to get to know God, you need to spend time with God. How? Any parent who has children, when they get to the age of maturity, that means when they are over 25 and you allow them to actually go on a date, <laughs> they don't know if they've not been polluted by the world, they have no clue what to expect. I'm trying to draw a parallel between getting to know someone and getting to know God. Because God is, is invisible, but He's more real than anybody else. And, 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 and we have to get to know God. And the Bible says in John 17 verse 3, This is life eternal, that they may know Thee, the only true God of Jesus Christ, whom Thou sent. So how do you get to know God? Same way you get to know anybody else. It is a journey. It is the unknown. It is an adventure. You have to spend time with that person. You have to talk to that person. And I know some people, initially, they don't say many things. So you take that girl on a date and she just looks at you and she's just pretty and she just smiles. But please, after the first date, if she still doesn't say anything. <laughs> I 
I'm going to do a series on relationships. You want to have a good marriage, you actually need much more than just the initial chemistry. Your, your, your brains need to connect. Your personalities need to connect. Your, uh, your passion needs to connect. And, and you, you, the respect should be mutual where the guy doesn't stifle the girl's dream. And now you my wife and you down here and I'm going to tr- control you, etc. No. No, she's created equal to you. She's, she is equal to you. So before you get married, you have the conversation. And after the marriage, you don't, don't change the rules and say, Jy is nou my vrou, nou doen jy wat ek sê. Nee, dit is nie wat jy gesê het voor ons getrouw het nie. So your relationship with God is the same. How many minutes were those? So we enter the holiest... I understand it's 2024. And we don't dress the way they dressed in those ways. Because let me tell you, your attire doesn't determine how holy you are. You can cover up from your, your head to your, your, your toe. It doesn't mean you are holy. We don't know what's going on in your heart, okay? I'm not saying dress low and behold. I'm saying to you, it's not the outward appearance that defiles a man. It's what's in your heart that defiles you. So we have boldness. Say, I have boldness. Say it. To enter the presence of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Say it. He says, by a new and a living way, which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is His flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Let us draw near. With a true heart, a heart that respects, a heart that reverences this holy God, A heart that is decided. A heart that is set on God. Because the the, the commandment from the Old Testament to the New Testament that is the same is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. That's not negotiable. God never comes second. God never takes second place. God is a jealous lover. God wants first place in your life. Listen, you better love God more than your husband. You better love God more than your wife. You better love God more than your culture. You better love God more than anything else in your life. You need to love God more than your child because your child cannot stop you from serving God. Your daddy cannot stop you from serving God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind and you will love your neighbour as yourself. It is the commandment that comes from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It is the only one. Because upon that hangs what? All the laws and the prophets. If you walk in love, you obey all the laws and the prophets. And by the way, understand this. The law is different to the prophets. The law is what Israel will call to live by and the prophets, the minor prophets and the major prophets were used by God to give us a glimpse into the future and the dispensation which was to come. That's why Christ fulfilled what? The law and the prophets. We're still living in a a, a time dispensation where the prophets, the, the, the prophecies of the prophets are being fulfilled. Jesus Himself fulfilled over 350 prophecies, which is in the natural impossible for anybody to do. So He is the Messiah. Historically, He's the Messiah. He is the risen Christ. He is the one who died for your sin. He is your mediator. Oh, come on, man. This is about Jesus Christ. He is the mediator of a better covenant. So when you you fall out of love with God, you will fall into love with something else. That's why you need to love God more than anybody else. You need to love God more than anything else. I said you need to love God more than anything else. You need to love God. And and, 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 and when you love somebody and have a relationship with somebody, you're sensitive to that person, right? So you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. You don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. You walk sensitively as a child of God. You know people that do stupid things are people that are not in touch with God at all. You can't be a Christian and do things that are opposite to the Bible. It's not possible. You walk with God, you're led by the Spirit. You've received the Spirit of adoption. Now you are led by the Spirit. Amen? Relationship. God now lives in you. And He guides you from within. Our beautiful television viewers, 
we are so grateful to have this time with you. You know, all you have to do is start somewhere and just walk into the room. You don't know, need to know what to say. Like young people that go on a date, they don't know what to say. They've got the butterflies and everything um, and they just go. Just get yourself in the presence of God and just read your Bible and just say, God, I love you. Don't say that to the girl. Say that to God and your relationship is going to grow in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. So our number one goal in life should be our pursuit of God. Please listen to me. Because the minute you stop pursuing God in spirit and truth, John chapter 4, God's looking for people to worship Him in spirit and truth, you will begin to pursue something else. So until you've not established your relationship with God, something else will try and replace your relationship with God. It can be a cause, but a wrong cause. It can be an offense, hurt, it can be your culture, your tradition. That's why we serve God, listen, based on the Bible. Not based on portions of the Bible. So when I say to people there is one way, then some Christians get mad. Because their culture says there's many ways to God. No, your Bible says there's one way to the Father. No, you can do better than that. There's one way to the Father. There's one way to God, and His name is Jesus Christ. It's not all roads lead to Rome, and we cannot add to the redemptive work of Christ because then we nullify the power of the cross in our lives. We cannot add to it. We cannot add sacrifice to the sacrifice of Jesus. We cannot add rituals. We cannot add works because then we nullify the work of Christ. Are you listening? So truth will always offend people. Jesus is called the rock of offense. So uh, truth stands by itself. So when, when truth is spoken, you, the Bible says, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to, to save your soul. And you will know the truth, John chapter eight, and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth, not a, a, a little story over there. The truth is the person of Jesus Christ. You will know the truth. You will know Jesus and Jesus will set you free. Please listen. Take it in the context. Verse 36, for whom the Son is set free is free indeed. It's talking about the Son. The truth is the Son. Not your version. The truth is the Son. You will know the truth who is a person. And that person will set you free. So we have to understand what Jesus did for us. I don't want to go back to what I said, because if we don't, we always are going to wrestle with guilt, shame, and condemnation, especially condemnation. And the Afrikaans, Romeinen 8, vers 1, says, There is no verurteiling for the people in Christus. Because if your heart condemns you, English is, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Because if your heart condemns you, you have no boldness to access the presence of God. So we have to first set our hearts at ease about who God is and about our access before God. Because most people, if you say God, what do they think? And again, your image of God is the most important image you can have of any image in life. When I say God, what do you see? When I say Father, well, earthly Father, There's only one who can come up in your mind and that's your father. Whatever experiences you had. And some of you had great dads. Some of you had very involved dads. My kids were uh, uh, blessed because, uh, and it's not criticism, my my dad, I led him to to the Lord, he's in heaven today, etc. But that generation had no understanding about showing affection or love. And I decided I'm going to be the opposite of that because I don't have to be the product of, 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 of what I, uh, my negatives. I can decide to be the positive of the negative. And everything I never received, I will give my children. Never heard, I love you from my father. I told him I love him. Those people, not those people, that generation just couldn't say, my son, I love you. Listen, from the day my children were born, I said, I love you, I love you, I love you. You are gorgeous, you are beautiful. They've heard it a million times in their lives. Because I told them everything I never heard. 
I wasn't going to live this little hurt victim for the rest of my life because I'll tell you, I got saved at a young age and I really encountered the love of God. I really encountered the outpouring mercy and the grace of God and I became secure in a Father who loved me when I least deserved it. Come on. And until you don't have that, the image in your mind is always going to be a wrong one. That's why even when, when, when the disciples came and said, your mother and your brothers are looking for you, Jesus said, that's not my mother and my brothers. He wasn't saying they're not his physical relationship. He said, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of my father and do the word of my father. Because in the life you're after, these two beautiful daughters of mine are not my daughters. They are my brother, no, my sisters. Because we're going to be like angels. Huh? Not a little chubby angel. We, we're going to be eternal spirits because you already are an eternal spirit living in that body. And the world tries to speak to your body, your flesh, your mind. That's why we have to live spiritually conscious and develop this relationship with God and allow God to heal the hurts of your past. Otherwise, the hurts of your past will stop you from engaging with your heavenly Father. So we, we have to set our hearts at ease, which most people struggle with. So when they, when they do something wrong, they stay away from church. When they go pray, they feel guilty because they've not been established. Please listen to me. You, you have to be established. My daughters know I'm their father since they were born. They don't have to work for my approval. They have my approval. They have my favor. David as well, sitting there in Pretoria, my million grandkids as well, my trillion in-laws as well. <laughs> so acceptance is what you have. Access has been established. Making use of that access is a whole different story. So if there's any condemnation, and condemnation is because of fear, Condemnation is because your heart has not been established in righteousness. Because the Bible says that in 1 John chapter 4, those who fear have not been established in the love of God. Those who fear the judgment of God. Those who fear God's punishment because Jesus faced your punishment. Now we have to come freely. We come as we are. And it's in the presence of God that we will be transformed. It's in the presence of God, listen, that repentance is an ongoing work. What is repentance? It's yielding more and more and more to the Lordship of Jesus. Repentance is not a once-off thing. Repentance is ongoing until the day you go home to be with the Lord. That as you spend time with the Lord and you did something wrong and the Holy Spirit brings it to your heart, you say, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And you move on in your relationship with God. Repentance is not a season. It's not works to get saved. It is you are saved. Then the process of sanctification, heilig makang, begins to take place. And that's as you walk with God. God who is loving, God who is the potter, God is the refiner of the sons of Levi, God who washes and sanctifies His own church. Isn't that what the Bible says? He's coming back for a church, but who's washing the church? Jesus Christ is washing the church. When you spend time in the presence of God, He's gonna wash away your blots, and He's gonna wash away your dirt, and He's gonna wash away your shame, and He's gonna break the power of addiction, and He's gonna break the power of sin. The more you spend time with God, the more God's love is gonna overwhelm you, and the less hold the devil is gonna have on your life, and the stronger Christ-like Christian you are going to become. It is a journey. Repentance is a lifetime journey of yielding and surrendering to God in your life. Are you listening? So uh, if you kicked the cat or you drove in traffic and somebody cut you off and you said to them, Lackerman, um, you go pray, not with sin consciousness and the Holy Spirit just says, that wasn't okay. And you say, I'm sorry, Lord. Right? Otherwise, we grow calluses on our hearts. You say, I'm sorry, Lord. If you, if you say something bad about somebody, you do something, you mean. Then you get into the presence of God, the Holy Spirit will just say, that wasn't okay. 
You say, sorry, Lord, you learned through that, and you don't do it again, right? That's walking with God. It's not a rule book of repentance. Repentance is, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, because what the law could not do, God did by sending His Son. So now we are led by the Holy Spirit, but we are under the power of grace, which, by the way, is much more powerful than the law. Because the law could not purge you, and the law could not purify you. And the law kept you from God, who is the source of life and transformation. So Jesus gave us access into the presence of God. And as we spend time in the presence of God, it's God that works in you, both to will and do His good pleasure. It's God that is perfecting you inside out. It's God that is cleansing you. So you cannot be a happy sinner if you have a relationship with God. You cannot be. You're going to wake up the next day and you're going to feel that wasn't okay. Like, mm, right? And then repentance is required to say, I'm so, to get right with God. Because we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. If any man sin, we have an advocate. And if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. Because the blood works continually. Cleanses you all the time. But God is the one who points the things out in your life because the process of sanctification is growing more and more into the statue of Jesus. And none of us are there yet, are we? Anybody? Let me see you glow, levitate. Anybody? Yes, we perfected in Christ, but the same blood that perfected us is now sanctifying us. It's working in us. Perfecting holiness. Holiness that was obtained through the blood of Jesus. Perfecting. So it's only while you're in the journey that God is working in you. You bail out of the journey, you backslide. You walk with God, you progress. But you are, the, you are whose workmanship? Huh? You are whose workmanship? You are whose workmanship? You are His workmanship. Not your workmanship. Not a church's workmanship, you are His workmanship. He started the good work in you. He will finish the good work in you. All you have to do is stay in communion and fellowship with God, stay in the Word. Because every time you read the Bible, you are taking a bath, you are cleansing yourself, you are being sanctified. God sanctifies you through the Word. So when you read the Word, the Word washes you. The Word purifies your thoughts. So we cannot take the Word out. We need to spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer, spend time in church. I'm going to talk that next week because the church, the, the corporate dwell, uh, 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 dwelling place of the saints, the Bible says is God's dwelling place. Yes, He lives in you, but individually you're never going to make it by yourself. The, the issue is not whether you're a Christian. That brick in the building is a brick. But that brick has no purpose outside of uh, uh, where it's been placed. Amen? And, and, and your Christianity, by the way, is not about you. Your Christianity is about your brother and your sister. Your Christianity is about the lost, the broken. That's what your Christianity is about. It's not about you. Right? I'll be finished now. So 1 John chapter 3 verse 9 in the Bible says, And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before God. Set our hearts at rest when we come into the presence of God. Not coming with guilt, shame, condemnation, but coming established in righteousness, which is right standing with God, set apart by the blood of Jesus, sanctified, justified by the blood of Jesus, faith in the grace of God, which is just as if I never sinned. So when I come into the presence of God, I can come boldly. I come as I am. Monday, I can come, no matter how I feel. I don't have to work. I don't have to go through a cleansing ritual. Thank God for that. Because in the Old Testament, before anybody could get close to God, there was a lot of things people had to do. And I think it's, I don't want to say it's too easy now, but maybe it's too easy now. It's, it's so easy now that it's, people don't want to do anything. It's like saying to people, you never have to go to gym and you're going to be in perfect shape. So, so people get their gym membership, but they never go to gym 
and they want to look like their trainer. So, 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 so this Christian thing is something we, we live. It's something we do. It's a walk. It's a talk. It's a dialogue. It's, it's entering God's presence. It's using the privilege you have to access God's presence. It's part of your hang-ups, your faults, your flaws, whatever you did. Because your sins no longer separate you from God. Jesus dealt with your sin. It doesn't mean you can live a sinful life. It means sin does not keep you out of the presence of God. The remedy to your sin is the person of Jesus Christ. So you get into the presence of God, God will deal with your sin. Amen. So he says, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence or boldness before God. So if there's no condemnation in your heart, you have confidence to access the presence of God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments, which is His word. What commandments are they? What are they? Huh? I told you earlier. What commandments? Is He speaking about the Ten Commandments? What commandments is He speaking about? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy might. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So when you access the presence of God, you need to make sure that your relationship with God is right this way and your relationship with your brother is right this way. Because you can't have a relationship with God and you're in strife with your brother. It's not possible. The second is equal to the first. You can't hate your brother and think you're having a relationship with God. As a matter of fact, I said it last week, Jesus made it very clear. When you come to the altar and they remember that your brother sinned against you, leave your gift, your prayer, your worship, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and spend time with God. You can't just cut people off. You have to go see your mom. You have to go see your dad. You have to go see that brother if you have to, or you have to forgive them. Because unforgiveness will keep you from a living relationship with Jesus. Don't be held in bondage by people that are dead. Don't be held in bondage by people that, that uh, uh, did something to you 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You talk to some people, my word, if people only knew the Bible like they knew the offenses people did to them. You talk to some people and they can, they can say, on the 13th of November, 1982, you did this. On the 17th of April, 19... Uh, um, 80 what you did this and they have that whole thing listen i know young people are sitting here tonight but learn don't keep a record of one another's offenses in your marriage don't bring up the same offense again and again and again and again and again once you've dealt with it let it go say it let it go say it let it go otherwise every time you have an argument you are going to bring up, but you did it then. But I thought we dealt with what we did then. So you haven't forgiven. Because if you forgave, you would not remember. Remember December, but nothing else. No, 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 the Bible says love does not keep a record of other people's sins. So you married, how do you keep a record? So you want to stand in church and hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. No wonder you can't enter God's presence. You're trying, but you can't. Because you've got issues with people and you've got the dates and the places and the memories. It's real. You can't be there. It's going to stop you in your walk with God. It will destroy your marriage. I'll, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. It doesn't go together. He says, we're imitators of God. We walk in love, Ephesians 5 says. God says, your sins and your iniquities I will no longer remember. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. You don't have the right to remind any person of their past sins. You have, don't have the right. Amen. God's forgiven them. God's forgotten them. Who are you to remind people of what they did wrong yesterday? Who are you to even consider 
the relationship somebody else has with God. How do you know that person didn't repent yesterday while you are still talking about that person today? You don't know. So you just mind your own business, right? But in your, in your walk, don't build up issues. Don't, the longer you are married, the more issues you have. But you've done it before. Jesus said 70 times 7 for the same thing. 70 times 7. Maar jy dit nou die derde keer gedoen. En, hoeveel keer het jy die selde ding gedoen? Hoeveel keer het jy vir jy gesê, ja, ek sal vir jou, jy nog iets het doen, alalalala, dan is jy weg. Dan kom jy terug, drie maanden later, ja, jy nog ek is terug, of jy nog iets het doen, alalalala, dan is jy weer weg. How many times have you done the same thing over and over and over and over and failed God? Let's get real here, man. How many? Huh? Huh? Hello? Heaven to earth? How many times have you had the same thought? If we could put your thoughts into a movie, what would we see? Huh? Question. That's why Jesus said, deal with a beam in your own eye. Don't be one of those people when, when you look in the direction, everybody ducks. Be humble. Walk with God. Love God. Love people. Last time I saw you, not the judge. You're not sitting on the throne of judgment. You are not God. You have not been appointed by God. Oh, give the Lord a bit of praise, right? Um, unforgiveness. I spoke about it last week and we had several testimonies and I'll do one evening on this because people need to be delivered in this area. But unforgiveness is a bad thing. And how do you know you've got unforgiveness? You talk about the same thing over and over. You repeat the same thing. The same issue comes to the surface. Now that unforgiveness has now already become bitterness. It's a poison. It's destroying you. Sure, you've been hurt. Something happened that hurt you. But you cannot camp at that place of hurt. You have to forgive. As God forgave you. Do you think our sins did not hurt the Father? Hurt Jesus? Jesus who paid the price and when we sin, we sin against Him. And yet He forgave us. You don't harbor bitterness. You forgive. That's why Jesus said every single day when you pray, forgive. Because I think every day there are people we have to forgive. Not some days. Every day. Even if it's your husband squeezing the toothpaste this way and you want it this way. Say, forgive him. No, buy him his own. We settle this quickly. There's your toothpaste. <clears throat> There's your tube. My tube. Right? But sometimes that can become an issue. It's like you're getting angry with your husband every time you brush your teeth. <laughs> Buy him his own toothpaste. Let him squeeze it the way he wants to squeeze it. Just let it go. It's a nothing. It's not an issue. <clears throat> Amen. So I know what some of you are going to do by a tube of toothpaste tomorrow. Amen. Or you live together um, in, a, in a room with somebody else and uh, they don't have the best toilet manners or whatever. I can't even imagine. Jesus help us because my mother taught me cleanliness is next to godliness. So for me, it's like, um, I mean, please, let's not even go there. You know, shower, bath, put on doom, zoom, whatever you have to do, be presentable. Amen. I mean, you, when you go on the date, the girl should not fall over every time you open your mouth. Brush your teeth. 
get some dental floss. Amen. Yeah. Yes. We'll do a marriage series. We're going to talk about all these kind of things because the things people struggle with are not the spiritual things. It's easy to pray. I'm not mocking prayer. I'm saying it's easy to do this because your eyes are closed. You have to look at nothing. It's like just And I was like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And now, Jesus. You have to open your eyes and deal with that child that's made the tenth poop of the day. Not very spiritual, right? So he says, if your heart doesn't condemn you, you have confidence. Whatever we ask, we receive because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, which is what? We obey the word of God. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. As He gave us commandment. There is no relationship with God outside of Jesus. There is no sustaining relationship with God outside of the person of Jesus Christ. You cannot walk with God and not love your brother. It is not possible. Every time the Apostle John, the Apostle of Love, addresses this, he talks about a direct parallel between your relationship with man and your relationship with God. Religion is mean. Religion denies people access to the very presence of God. Jesus came and He said, Whosoever, anybody is welcome. Anybody that is weary and heavy laden, Anybody that is worn out by this world, worn out by religion, worn out by sin, everybody that is hopeless and broken, that was Jesus Christ. He didn't come for the whole. He said, the whole do not need a physician. I came for those who are sick. He never came for the self-righteous religious people. He came for the lost. That's why he called, he's called Jesus. The word Jesus means he shall save his people from their sin. And we all need saving. We all need to be saved from sin, but we also need to be saved from ourselves. And that is a journey of sanctification, a journey of surrender as we spend time with God. My children, all three of them said the same thing on their wedding days because I did not allow certain things. Like I believe God doesn't allow certain things in our lives. If God loves you, He's going to discipline you. Not with sickness and disease, but He's just going to stand until you come around His way. It's because He loves you. And my children all said the same thing. Although I was firm as a father, now their husbands uh, lord it over them. No, they don't. Uh, it's a joke. Marcus, smile as a belief. They all said this, and that's the key for me. They never slept around, messed around, because they said, we never wanted to disappoint our father. Not they feared their father. We never wanted to disappoint you, dad. That's it. That says a lot. When you walk with God in a loving relationship, you don't want to disappoint him. You want to do what is pleasing to the father. I said you want to do what is pleasing to the father. That's a whole different perspective. That's not a law. That is, I want to please you, Father. I want to please you, Father. And the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you, if you go in the wrong direction, you're going to feel, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, no. That guy that's smiling and giving you five million roses and, and, and taking you to the most expensive, expensive restaurants on his father's credit card, that guy, uh, you sit there and you're suddenly in this bubble called romance, whatever nonsense that is, I still want to figure that one out um, because there's no reality in that reality is put the candle out put the lights on have a conversation mind to mind spirit to spirit do you love God okay How can you even think of having a relationship with somebody that is, is not in love with God? Oh, yeah. 
somebody that is not serving God. Because if that person is not serving God, he's going to stop you from serving God. The day he puts his ring, this ring on your finger, that day he will come with the scriptures out of context. Submit. Dan sit jy daar as die jongvrou en jy wil nou net allemaal die Heere eerbiedig en ek submit, ek submit, ek submit en vijf jaar later het jy gedooi. Vijf jaar later het jy jou persoonlijkheid verloor. Vijf jaar later is jy skadie van wie God jou geroep het om te wees. Want jy, self, jy het jouself verloor in die verhouding. Luister, jy verloor jouself nooit in die verhouding nie. Jy moet jouself vind in die verhouding. Jy verloor jouself nie in die verhouding met Jesus Christus nie. Jy vind jouself in die verhouding met Jesus Christus. You find yourself in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't lose yourself. You are lost until the day you come to Jesus Christ. That's when you find yourself. By finding the love that God has for you. And uh, you date a guy and he's selfish and self-centered. He's not the right guy for you. I know guys leave the church because I talk like this and then they say other things, etc. But the fact is, they don't want to hear the truth. The, for me, telling the girls as my daughters and say, listen, if that guy loves you enough, he should treat you with absolute respect and he should treat you uh, and he should serve you and he should not lord it over you. Because if he lords it over you before you get married, what do you think he's going to do after you get married? And as far as I'm concerned, and I did it with all three of my kids, I had a conversation with the boys especially, because now they're taking my daughters, you get it. David took somebody else's daughter, that was easy. So I had to talk about values, and I said, I raised these two girls free-spirited. You don't marry them and take the light out of them, because I'm their father. Before you showed up, I was there and I will be there. And you will take responsibility as a husband, but you will not dampen the light in them. You will not stifle their the, the dreams and their visions. You make an agreement and you will not change it after you get married. Because I think it's a violation of covenant. When people get married and they have terms of agreement before they get married and after the marriage, the terms change. And suddenly the husband says to the wife, Thou shalt not work. Thou shalt be barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen all the days of thy life. This, thus saith I, Abraham, your Lord, and thou shalt submit according to the word of God. You are misquoting scripture, buddy. You love her as Christ loves the church first. You serve her. You lift her. You honor her. You bless her. You cause her to radiate. That's your job as a man. You don't take the light out of her. You make her a better version of herself. You don't make her about you. So I say that to the men. I can't speak as a woman because I'm not a woman, but I have things to say to the woman. But I won't say it tonight. Lest I offend you and you take it out on your husband. Amen. Jesus loves you. Listen, young person sitting up there, maybe your first time in church, I don't know. Jesus loves you. You're not here by accident. Sitting there in Bloemenau, He loves you. Sitting in Johannesburg, in Potsdam, Cape Town, Kimberly, wherever you are tonight, I want to tell you Jesus loves you. And I want to tell you that with this spirit of secularism that's coming into our country and people are turning away from churches, it's a sad thing. Churches are running empty, it's a sad thing. And then Christians end up fighting one another and we're actually on the same side and we have one enemy that's actually the devil and then we end up fighting one another. How dumb can you be and still breathe? And churches are running empty. The values among our young people are are getting lost because the devil is trying everything in his power to take the church out of society. Spirit of secularism that's anti the kingdom of God. And, and, and I'm not talking about a charismatic church. As ek hoor, in gekerke word verkoop, in gekerke word leeg, dis a hartseerding, weet jy hoekom? Want die kerke die mense nog waardes geleer. 
Drei jonge mensen wat in die kerk groot geword het, het nog waardes gehad. Vandaag is, is baie van die kerk leeg. Want mensen het hulle respect voor God verloor in die samenleving. Meer mensen gaan shopping centers toe as kerk toe. En wit mensen. Wit mense wat, wat, wat veronderstel is om God vreesende mense te wees. Wat nie hulle voete in kerke sit op zondag nie. Die meerderheid wit mense in Zuid-Afrika sit nie hulle voete in kerke nie. Weggedraai van die Heere. Dis die waarheid. Seculair geword in hulle uitkijk. En het plaats nie. En ons dink nie hierdie mense moet bereik word nie. En hulle sit elke op hulle sierle moenstoel en elke in het opinie, en die regering doen net wat hulle wil, en wette word, in die land ingebring, wat jou nageslag gaan beinvloed. Maar ons is te verdeeld, om te staan vir God, en vir die saak van God, om te besef, het gaan nie oor een kerknaam nie, het gaan oor christenskap, ek sê het gaan oor christenskap, het gaan oor die koninkryk van God. I pray that God blesses every church in South Africa. I pray that God fills every church in South Africa. I pray that God causes people to run back to churches, every church, Dutch Reformed, Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever the name of that church. I pray that the Holy Ghost will send people back to churches, that people will go serve God in the name of Jesus, whether you talk in tongues, whether you lift your hands, it does not matter. If you call on the name of Jesus Christ, we are on the same side. We are blood-washed people, children of the living God. And we need the church to be strong in every community. We need the church to be strong in the townships, in Dipslut, in Mitchell's Plain, where crime is rife. We need the church to arise in South Africa. So we need to pray. We need to pray for God's kingdom. Listen, child of God. We need to pray for a mighty move of God. I mean, whether you speak in tongues or not, so what? It's not going to get you to heaven if you don't. And it's not going to get you to heaven if you do. Why fight the brother that is talking in tongues? Why make doctrine your issue whilst love should be the issue? What the heck is wrong with you? If you don't want to clap your hands in church, that's fine. You'll do it in heaven one day. Right? So pray for other churches. When you drive past the church building, say, Father, bless that church. Pray for the churches in the townships. Pray for the churches. We have thousands of churches closed down during COVID. Thousands. Thousands. Churches are running empty. Are you listening? Yeah. It's a fact. And then Christians sit and fight other Christians. Have we lost our minds? We are on the same side. If you believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Give the Lord a praise. Amen. No, I said, give the Lord a praise. You're not clapping for a man, you're clapping for Jesus. Give the Lord a praise, come on. Come on, give him a praise. Hallelujah, come on, give him a praise. Come on, let's praise him for a moment. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. Come on, praise him, praise him all over South Africa. Let us praise him and exalt the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We glorify the name of Jesus. We lift up the name of Jesus over every name in this country. Principalities will be brought down. Rulers of darkness will be brought down. Spiritual weakness in high places will be dismantled. The voice on the battleground is the voice of rejoicing, CRC. We need to rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Spirit. The devil has no power against the spiritual weapons God has given us. Come on. Give Him a praise a little bit longer. Hallelujah. We praise You, Father. We glorify You, Jesus. We lift up Your name over South Africa. We lift up Your name over Deep Sluit. We lift up Your name over Mitchell's Plain. We lift up Your name over every part of South Africa. We lift up Your name over Your servants that You've raised up, Father. 
We pray for every minister, for every pastor. We pray that you bless them, Father. Bless their churches. We pray that you move in every church in South Africa where the name of Jesus is being glorified. Build your church, Lord. You said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. We pray for a move of God in South Africa. Before and during these elections, a move of God will be platalant here. Wherever people are, a move of God by the power of the Holy Ghost. A move of God that Christians will arise. Christians will arise. Christians will arise. Your church will arise. We pray for this, Father. In the name of Jesus. Come on, come on, come on. That your house will be a house of prayer for all nations. All nations. A house of prayer for all nations. All nations will come and worship you, Father. We'll worship you. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor, for we all have access to you. One way, that is the name of Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one moving please. Here in Pretoria, Blumen, if, you remain, if you're standing, remain standing for a moment. If you've come here tonight, you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe at one time you did, but you've grown cold and you've driven away or you've wandered away from Jesus. Tonight you have to come back. It doesn't matter what you have done. It matters what you do with this moment. There is a heaven to gain. There is a hell to shun. And your life is as a vapor. The Bible says it's a point for, for men wants to die. Then the judgment. There's one way and that's Jesus. You've come here tonight. Many of you have heard this for the first time. Because you were raised in, in, in a different belief. That you access God different ways. No. You access God through the blood of Jesus Christ. That means the sacrifice, the price Jesus paid for you. And tonight you can have a relationship with God. Maybe you drifted away from Him like the prodigal. Tonight you can come back. I want to pray for you tonight. I want to help you find your way back to God. Because that's where everything changes. You will find peace with God tonight in this place. And you will develop a relationship with this amazing God as your Father starting tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed, God talking to you. Jesus said, I will stand at the door of your heart and knock. If you open, I will come and sup with you. God wants a relationship with you. He's already declared His desire. Now it's your turn to accept heaven's invitation and to say, yes, Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed, you say tonight, that's me. I need a new beginning with God. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. If that's you, forget the people around you. Listen to your heart tonight where God is talking to you and prompting you. Tonight you say, that's me. I want to get right with God. If that's your desire, quietly, wherever you are, lift your hand quickly all over this place. Raise it up. Slip it up high, 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 all over this place. Let me pray with you. God bless you, bless you, bless you. God bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Many hands. God bless you, God bless you, bless you. Raise it up, raise it up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Raise it up. God bless you, bless you, bless you. Many people all over. God bless you, God bless you. God bless you. We have access. We come as we are. We don't have to first get ourselves right. We come as we are. There in Johannesburg, raise your hand. God's talking to you. Over there in Bloemfontein tonight, on that balcony, God's talking to you. There's a stirring in your heart. You don't understand it in your mind, but God's talking to you. Dan puts of stroom here, roer jou hart van vanaan. God praat met jou jong mens, want God het a groot plan met jou lewe. Maar hy lewe sal geanker wees in, in jou verhouding met God. Keer terug na Jesus toe vanavond. Gee jou lewe vir Jesus vanavond. This is the beginning and the end of all this. One more time before I pray. You've not yet raised your hand tonight. There's a stirring. Quickly slip your hand. Say yes. Include me in that prayer. Now. God bless you. Thank you. Slip it up. God bless you. Slip it up. Now please look at me. Many, many, many of you have raised your hands. I would love to pray with each one of you individually. Can you please stand to your feet, everybody in this place, if you can, if you're well able, to make it easy for people to come to Christ. Many of you raised your hands. I'm going to pray with you in a moment in all our churches. Some of you brought your friends. And we know that your love for your friend will bring your friend to Christ tonight. So all over this place. If you raised your hand and you want to get right with God, you need a new start. You want to surrender your life to Jesus. I want you to take your Bible, your personal belongings, your iPad, whatever you brought to church. And you're going to hold on to it. You're not coming to lay it down here. Yeah. You're holding on to it. It's so it doesn't get relocated meaning stolen in your absence so you're bringing it you're not laying it down you're coming 
to receive Christ tonight. So all over this place, if you raised your hand, I want you to take your Bible, your purse belongs, leave your seat wherever you are. Don't think about it, but you know you're on the knee. The Heere praat met jou, God roer jou in jou hart vanavond. Kom vanavond, kom soos jy is, kom vry. Aanvaar en ontvang God se vergifnis, God se genade, God se liefde. Come on tonight, it matters not what you have done. Put your arm around your friend. Walk your friend to the altar tonight, come on. In the name of Jesus, come on, many of you lifted your hands. Step out of your seat tonight and come in the name of Jesus. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come tonight in Jesus' name. Come tonight. Receive God's gift of forgiveness. Come on, let's keep on clapping and encouraging people as they walk to the altar tonight. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. The church is one generation away from failure. We need to get people saved. We need to get young people saved. We need a move of God in South Africa, in our campuses, in our schools. Come on, young person. God's got a great future for your life, a great plan for your life. But you need to make up your mind that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Come tonight. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. Come on, come on, come on. the devil and we will continue to do what we are called to do plunder hell and populate heaven say amen in Jesus name amen amen I want to tell you God loves you and I respect the fact that you've come down here today God's doing something in your life. And I see all these young men and girls, but young men. I was messed up at 17, 18. Anger, a lot of nonsense that I did by then. So I don't just see people, I see individuals. Some of you are angry about things that's happened in your life. I feel it tonight, angry. I was an angry young person. I did a lot of things. I was self-destructive. I was angry and I heard the truth as you did tonight and sometimes our anger is justified we think until we meet Christ and we have to let go of that anger and that's the journey of sanctification you know people come with repentance just in the the physical uh, things people do it's the issues of the heart that are the difficult issues for repentance to truly take place. Because that's the things people justify. 
they justify their anger, they justify their bitterness, they justify their, their resentment. And that is a deeper work of repentance, giving that over. It's easy to take your, your, your dacha and flush it down the toilet and then wake up the next morning and go look for it. Next <laughs> man. Or you, you know, we had so many people, then they break the bar and they throw the whiskey down. Um, and the next day, the guy goes outside. Man, there's a Tlani sewage train. So, um, but repentance is ongoing. And I want to say this to you, that if you messed up in any way, I, you know, Jesus doesn't look at what you did. He understands why. He answers the question. Religion addresses fruit. Jesus addresses root. You change the root, the fruit automatically will change. You modify the fruit, the fruit will reappear later on again. That's why the, the root has to change. And that means we have to graft it into Christ, the vine, John chapter 15. Then things change automatically. So please, I, I feel... I feel some of you standing here today as a man. I feel anger. And uh, uh, I don't know what happened to you, but I pray that God gives you the grace. Um, I'm not going to look at you now, look in the air, that God gives you the grace to forgive those people. It may be anger of something that happened to your mother, your grandmother, generational anger. You know, anger is like a, it's like a fire. It's like a fuel that will consume you, as will bitterness. It's, it's, it's like a fire that burns you out from the inside. You don't want that. You don't want anger. You don't want that. You don't want those negative emotions to control your life. You have to let it go. Today you have to let it go. My brothers, my brothers, my brothers. There's a righteous anger and that's when um, it comes to God's kingdom. But then there's an anger that God says, don't allow anger to overwhelm you. And, and Proverbs warns against anger again and again and again and again. So don't allow anger to be the root. And, and anger is a result of hurt. People are hurt, so they get angry. Tonight you're going to put that in the hands of Jesus. Tonight you're going to put your life in the hands of Jesus. Okay? All of it. Your failures, sin, your disappointments. Some of you think, oh, in the world could I have done it? It's okay. God knows. And even maybe you're standing as a young girl and you've been involved with a sugar daddy. I know all the stuff that happens, etc. Tonight, you go smash that cell phone that that man gave you. You're going to be better off without that rubbish. You don't need a fancy cell phone and you don't need, you don't need, any of, you don't need that hold that that person has over you or had over you. You go break it so he doesn't have access to you again. You break it, girl. You are better than that. Tonight, God's putting a robe of righteousness upon you and he's loving you so put your hand on your heart come on I, I love you but God loves you much more a million times more I want the best for you but you have to do this tonight amen being fully conscious and aware of what you're doing say this tonight say Jesus I give you my heart you know everything about me what I've done where I've been you know what's going on on the inside of me and tonight I come to you for help. I open my heart and I invite you to take your rightful place as my Lord and Savior. Heal me, deliver me, and wash me in your precious blood. Forgive me of every sin that I've committed. I believe that you went to the cross and you died in my place. You faced the judgment of God. So I don't have to. Tonight I confess with my mouth that God raised you from the dead and you are alive. I call on your name. Jesus Christ, Son of David, have mercy on me. Forgive my sin. Wash me in your blood. Set me free from the power of the devil. And fill me with your Holy Spirit to live a new life for you in Jesus' name. And right now, as I receive your forgiveness, I forgive every person that sinned against me. 
Help me, Holy Spirit, to walk in freedom. Those who hurt me bad, help me to forgive them so I can be free. In Jesus' name, thank you for hearing my prayer and for giving me the power tonight to live as a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Come on, come on, my sisters, my brothers. Come on. Come on, let that weight be lifted off of you. Come on, those are no longer tears of shame, tears of pain. Those are tears of joy. Because he said, I'll give you beautiful ashes. Come on, come on. No longer anger. Forgiven. You forgive that man that molested you. You forgive that person. I know it's hurtful. And we want to help you. We have um, specialized counselors. We have people that are trained in this area. These are real things people work through. I mean, I can't imagine what a person must feel like when they've emotionally been abused and, and violated by a parent, an uncle, a grandfather, and, and there's so much of that happening, a child that was raped and all these kind of things. These are the real issues that we should care about, right? Broken people. That's Luke 4, 18 and 19. That's why Jesus came, not to give us a religion. People are hurting all around us. And oftentimes the people that act the happiest are those who are hurting the most. It's a cover up. Reach the needs of people. We are yet to make the world a better place. And the only way we can make this world a better place is to help people find their way back to God. There is no other way in Jesus name. Come on. We are an extension of God's love. Let's be the hands of Jesus. Healing hands that lift people, love people and heal people in Jesus name. Please can we give you a Bible if you don't have one. Say a prayer with you in all our churches. So if you will please here in Pretoria turn to my right, your left. We want to pray with each one of you. Give them a God bless you. In Johannesburg as well, turn to my right in Pretoria. In Blivene, turn to my left. Come on, let's give them all a big God bless you. Give them a God bless you. Give them, come on, come on. We love them. We praise God for every life that is being touched. Every person matters. Many of you stood at this altar and now you've served God for 10 years, 20 years. And your life is better for us. Hallelujah. Everybody has a story. Everybody matters. Amen. I want you to give two or three people uh, a, 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 a hug now in a righteous way. You understand? If you're a brother, I don't even want to say, I don't know how to say it. But, you know, the Bible says, greet one another with a holy kiss, meaning just love on somebody um, righteously, okay? There's no speed dating, but no, you can be me. And then you can watch the screen. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. We all know that encounters with God have the chance of producing a major shift in a person's life. But if we weren't in church on Sundays, we would lose out on the chance to have these many encounters. Being physically inside the house is vital for our spiritual growth, our mission, and godly relationships. And so our love for our fellow man should drive us to fill our churches with more and more people. We've seen that for many people, transport is a constraint that hinders them from coming to church. So we've made it our responsibility to fill buses and bring them here to experience something special and transformative every week. For all the years we've been doing this, we've seen many become essential members of our move as pastors, ushers, counselors, musicians, and many more, all because we brought them in on these buses. Yes, the church is more than a building, but when people are physically inside the house, lives change, and we cannot allow people to miss out on God because of transport difficulties. We still have a mandate. Every Sunday in Bloemfontein, Pretoria, and Johannesburg, approximately 9,000 people are brought in through our bus ministry, giving all of these people an opportunity for an encounter with God. This costs us almost 1 million rand a month. 
You see, family, we're the ones responsible for bringing people to Jesus, and our commitment to doing this cannot waver. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. We thank every generous CRC member who has committed to helping us bring in more people for the kingdom. Your giving enables us to grow our church and see the lost get saved. Let's continue to sow faithfully as we expand God's kingdom from glory to glory. God bless. The ushers can now stand as we receive the offering. Please note, for your security, the doors will remain closed. Thank you. Come on, family, one more shout of praise for Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give it up for the band for that amazing anointed item. In Jesus' name. Family, you're more than welcome to take your seats and turn your attention to the screen for the announcement clip. Thank you very much.
there and welcome to CRC, the best place to be, especially our first time visitors. Yes, TV. Now, family, if you would like to find out more about CRC, you can visit our website. And also, if you have missed out on any of Pastor Art's sermons, do not despair. We have a record of them on YouTube as well as Facebook, so go and check them out. we cut the ribbon we are opening the doors of this house for the presence of God this will be a habitation a dwelling place of God that people that are broken that are lost will come to this place to encounter the love the grace and the mercy of God this building is not going to go to heaven but this building will be a vehicle and a vessel that we can use to plunder hell and populate heaven but it's going to happen as we ourselves firstly get committed to our assignment. And what that is to be followers of Christ, to be full on for Jesus. Amen, family. Grateful to be a part of a church on the move. In Jesus' name, just a few announcements as we close for you to take note of. The first one is we are going to have John 3.16 this Tuesday, which is the 16th of April. It's going to take place in the chapel at 1900, which is 7 p.m. Please, if you've never gone to John 3.16, please join us so we can teach and equip you to win your world for Jesus Christ. Again, on the 16th of April, something that's happening is the launch of Bible School Term 2. So we encourage you to engage with this, be a part of it so you can grow in the Word of God, your walk with God, like Pastor Art said, and become closer to Him. Beautiful Ashes is still going on as we continue. Amen. We encourage you guys to drop off your items in the foyer at the CRC Cares boxes as we impact and change people's lives around Pretoria. And lastly, if you have prayer, we encourage you to stay behind. There's going to be leaders and pastors ready to pray for you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask that we close our eyes as we pray and close off. Father, thank you so much that we can even call you Father. Thank you that we can draw near to you like the Bible says, and you will draw near to us. Thank you that we can come into the Holy of Holies. Thank you that you tore the veil. And because of all this, we have the boldness, and we can be unashamed to make an impact in our world. Let us be ambassadors reuniting our world with Christ, as you've called us to do in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen and amen have a great evening for, uh, family thank you so much